Australian walked in, I'd be like, hey, g'day, yeah, hey, yeah. Like, yeah, Mark's here, I'm here yeah. with Mark. But Mac. When I'm with you, I'd say, like, Mark's here. And, you know, so no, but I that's sleep. a lot, it's a lot of effort, though. No, no, it's, it's actually natural. I slip into it, and then I, I kind of, it ends up being like someone doing a bad American accent, like a mid, like a battle strategy. Nasally, kind of. Like, like um, yeah, that's that's right. I'm a member of the NYPD, American police. I'm I'm from New York. The Aussies are really bad, like some bad Australian actors. So, but that was that. You mean you can you're telling that's me being bad? But I mean, you could how could you could you do it well? Well, yeah. I mean, oh, I don't know. I mean, this is how I do it. This is how I, when I talk to my mother, I would talk like that. Mother, it's talk a different thing. Mom, like I go, hey, mom, you know. I'm coming. I'm coming down there tomorrow. I'm. Uh, I've got to work on tonight. I'll be there at like eight o'clock. So what does that sound like? Is that? I'm not sure what that sounds like. It's kind of somewhere in between the two. I think it's in between. Because what I did was at school. I never realized this, but yeah. at school I faked an Australian accent because I wanted to fit in. When so, you oh when here. I was here. a little kid, yeah. So so wait, you were born in the states? Yeah, yeah. I came here when I was four, five, four. But your parents are Australian? No, no American. Both of them? Yeah. How, so, so neither one of them talk like you? No, they talk. You know, they're like you know, they're American. Like, hey, Greg, what's happening? Yeah, Greg, not, really? Me? Yeah, huh? And when I talk to them, when I talk to my mother, I talk like like I'm talking now. I go, Mom, I'm doing an interview with Mark Marin. He's a, an American comic. You probably don't know him because he's Jewish, and you, I know you're. Uh huh. You, know, you don't like no, Jewish you, people, sure. Yeah. But then when I'm with my friends, I talk like that. Like I go. Yeah, I'm Aussie. I'm a free. You know, I'm with Mark Marin. I'm doing uh, that his podcast. You know. And but what's easier to do? What's more well, natural? The Australian. The right? Australian's more natural when I'm with Australians. But when I find myself with an American or a Canadian, it it might it, it starts slipping out. So sure. I think my natural default position, the fakeness is, is to is be accepted it, by anyone. You're anyone who will to. like me, please. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so you're defaulted. Like uh, you could be talking like to a, a Sri Lankan. Yeah, and, and, oh, goodness me. Oh, look, I'm slipping into it already. <laughs> yeah, I get it. Sure. Yeah. Whoever will give you approval and make you feel whole in that moment yep. is what you will adapt to. Mm -hmm. So you, why did your uh, parents leave uh, America? My father worked for Ford as a designer with the Ford Motor Company. And at that stage in Australia, Australians... Uh, have only recently started trusting their own. Like there was, almost every executive in Australia was from England or the states. Right. So they needed some executives out here. So they brought out guys from America, and they offered him a you know a better job, better pay, you know, world travel. I think once a year they used to send us around the world. And so he was a Ford exec where in Michigan. Yep, in Michigan, and then yeah, to like move the here. original plant. Yeah, moved to Geelong. Geelong? Yeah, moving from Detroit to Geelong. Where the hell is Geelong? Geelong is an hour out of Melbourne. Is that where you live now? No, no, no. no. It, um, it's an hour out of Melbourne. It's like the second city of the state of Victoria. And with it, and that has all the paranoia and um, jealousy and everything that comes with it of not being the main. Apparently, 150 years ago, they, they tossed, you know, it was like a, tossing a coin to decide whether Melbourne or Geelong would be the capital. Oh. And uh, Melbourne got it. So Geelong is kind of bitter and, you know. So, but like, I don't understand this country. I'm not ignorant, but I, I just haven't done my homework. Yeah. Where's the... There's where, five states. Yeah. Where's the big rock, the big spiritual In rock? The center. And does anyone live out there? Uh, yeah. It's, it's near... What's it called? Um, it's called Uluru or Ayers Rock. Have you been out there? Yep. Why'd you go out there for? Was there a gig at the base of the rock? There's a... It's a town called Alice Springs. Yeah. Um, and that's the nearest city or near, nearest town uh -huh. to, uh, to that. And uh, we do gigs there sometimes. So really? that's why I was there. But I didn't go up it because the, the Aboriginal people actually don't don't like you to climb it. Uh -huh. And so, you know, white people climb it every, you know, it's always full of, uh, you know, German <laughs> tourists or Australians <laughs> climbing it. and um, Americans uh, on yeah, holiday from yeah, college. Yeah. Backpacks and all the the Aboriginal people are standing there hating the fact that everyone's climbing up this sacred thing. You know, and some woman went up there and did a strip tease recently oh, to them. get famous. Uh -huh. An American woman, she climbed to the top and then did a strip tease, which was videoed and put on YouTube. But uh, you know, well, there she's going to be uh, cursed by the Aboriginals. Mm. Well, she already is, I'm sure. Women aren't meant to play uh, didgeridoos or even have them aimed at them. It's, uh, it's meant to make you barren if you do that. 
Yeah. Kitty Flanagan does a good joke about that. She says like she's in her forties and yeah. hasn't got a kid or anything. She goes, I don't know. Sometimes I think being in that old girl didgeridoo band in the eighties may have had side effects. Yeah. So that's a common thing that people know that you can't aim a didgeridoo at a woman. No, and a it's woman not cannot play a didgeridoo. So she had to set that joke up. I would assume that's a sort of a regional joke. I don't know if that would fly. Uh, well, even here, a lot of people probably wouldn't get it. But right. um, uh, yeah, a lot of people probably don't know that women aren't meant to play them. You know. Well, I think it's important that we bring that up on the podcast because there might be women out there who uh, want to want to play the dish. well, who might be playing it and don't realize the trouble they're in. Yeah, well, <laughs> it depends if you um, if you want to have uh, sex without contraception, uh -huh. just play that ditch. Oh, so that's what it does. It'll yeah, make you barren. barren. Yeah, that's sort of a hard sell. I think as a man, if I walked in and some woman was like, <laughs> <laughs> "We're good, man. Yeah. Go bareback. Yeah, don't yeah, stop blowing so much and uh, yeah, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> bareback." Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that what you call it? Yeah, but barebacking, I always think of as um, there was a thing with gay men that became big about 20 years ago where yeah, after the AIDS, time. yeah, I yeah. know you were really young, but yeah. after the whole AIDS thing peaked, it was like a, a dangerous thing for gay men to do if you wanted to live on the edge. You'd, yeah. You'd bareback. And it, right. was, um, it was like a deliberate, you know, deliberate I think it's choice. actually still dangerous. Yeah. A couple of, couple yeah. of, for a few reasons. <laughs> so well, you, you get thrown so you, off. You come up, uh, so you came here when you were four, mm -hmm. and then you just, you grew up Australian. Yep. And, uh, yeah, pretty much started. And when, when did you do comedy? When did you start? Because I don't know if people know this, but Greg Fleet is uh, uh, infamous and, uh, and respected and mm. uh, adored, uh, adored figure. Adored and despised in equal measure. Yeah. Are you despised or are you just irritating? I don't think no. you're despised. I think people no. are more like, ah, oh, Fleet. Yeah, I, I um there was a long You've period tried of time. the patience of your country, Greg. Yes. And now I'm sort of behaving and uh, trying to make up for all the uh, the bad things that I did. Let's, but, well, let's talk about where it went bad because quite I, I know some of the people that listen to my podcast know this that when I was here in 1992 and the story about when I got sent home, uh, the, that, as I said in that story, the comic who was there when I got sent home was you. Yeah, I was you, the MC. Yeah, you were the MC. You had hair. Mm -hmm. You were younger. I remember it fairly <laughs> clearly. And I did not run into you again until like, what was it, 17 years later, that right, 92, 2002, 2000, yeah, 15 years later yeah. in Edinburgh. And I recognized you because of your teeth and your face. <laughs> and we sat there and bonded for a second, but there yeah. was never that moment where it was impossible. Like, we don't really know each other. And, and then it's sort of like, well, what have you been doing for 15 years? And it turns out, as I've picked up stories from you and other people, you've been up to quite a lot, a lot of, a lot of trouble. Well... The we okay. This is a, a way of explaining that. I don't. I still don't remember that gig. I, I still don't remember doing that gig with you. You getting sent home, any of that stuff. I mean, I know it happened because you told me about it. And when you told me, I sort of vaguely remember something like that. But I was doing so many drugs at that time. Like, for me to forget working with uh, a guy from America, who on the second night was sent back to America. First week. No, it was a week. It took right. a week. And well, we, for me I, to forget that happened is a, is a remarkable thing. I can't, um, I can't believe that I don't remember that happening. Well, so that was 19, what, 92-ish. Mm. So where were you in your career at that point in time? I mean, you were, you were still emceeing, so you weren't a, a huge, infamous, popular... Well, what they used to do here was um, you'd get to a certain level, yeah. and if you were you know, around the top end of stand-up, you would get to MC the international acts when they came out. So that was actually a good gig. It was. In fact, I've, I've got a feeling it was one of the first times they let me do it. And that's why, you know, you, the whole thing falling apart and you getting sent home and everything. I probably was going, oh, God, it's my fault. It's my fault. They just sent the wrong American home. I just wonder who they brought in to fill in for me. Uh, who it knows? Would have been, it would have been someone really mainstream. And, and as you said back then... Australian shows always around that time, and it has changed now. It's become much more generic. But back then, it was uh, a new stand-up going on first, like a weird double act of like, uh, you know. Right, that's who I had, yeah. uh, these two women. The, the flat the whites, they were called, I think. Oh, so you remember that. Yep. Are they uh, still around? No, they're not around. One of them is a reviewer. She does comedy reviews. So they'd have like a, a, a new stand-up on first, a weird double act or a triple act on second. They would always have a juggler or a magician, like you had the guy getting out of the straitjacket. I think he was on a unicycle, in yeah. my recollection. Is that possible? Yeah, I think he was the same guy who had a thing where he'd, you know, he'd had a guillotine on stage and he'd, you know, chop a 
the lettuce in half and then he'd put his head in it and he'd, he'd come down. It was actually kind of impressive because of that noise and everything. You'd think, yeah. oh, God, he's going to kill himself yeah, and then every the, night. And then the insecure Jewish guy from, uh, yeah. you know, from the States. Yep. After all that, and it was also, horrendous. Well, people also don't know that you, um, you as a, a clean and sober man for some time, Relapsed on the way back to no, I did to the U.S. Yeah, yeah on I the mean plane. that was one of that probably was the second time I was trying to get sober, and I was fucking done when yep. I got. I was just, you know I wasn't going to meetings and shit, and I on that plane I just started knocking back vodka, and by the time I got back to San Francisco where I was living, I'm like I'm finished. I'm not cut out for this <laughs> shit. This comedy but, thing's a mistake. But that that's uh you know knowing what I do about you, that's a heavy blow for for it to oh, be enough to make you go you know get back on the way well the, you know i don't that, at that time i'd get a year you know year and change you know i did that several times there's nothing wrong with that my friend no That's i know admirable getting made, a year you've made a career out of <laughs> almost getting a year yeah you? i i um <laughs> i don't have room to store all those chips in my house so i gotta i've always got a relapse before a year gets up so when you were doing that gig so that's 92 so you were strung out then yeah i was using yeah, dope oh, yeah heroin yep yeah. Now, how the hell do you, are you a guy who can function on that? So you would... You, well, yeah. Yeah, I would... I would um, the thing is, with heroin, it, um, if you get a habit, yeah, you have to have it to function. You know, like it, it, the, my ultimate horror is doing a gig, or it used to be doing a gig hanging out, like yeah. you're needing to score. So I used to go around uh, all the time. I'd get a gig, someone would ring up and say, oh, you know, I've got a gig for you. It's, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then I'd say two things. I'd say, great. And I'd say, hey, is there any way I could come and get the money now? Right. And, uh, or, or just before the gig. So quite often, hardly ever did I get paid, you know, because I would have already <laughs> spent the money, you know. Or I'd go that afternoon and get the money. It was sort of like prostitution. I'd get yeah. the money so I could buy the drugs, so I could do the gig to earn the money to buy the drugs to do the gig. And, you know, it's like chicken and egg. Yeah. You know, but, you know was he doing comedy to afford the heroin, or is he doing the heroin to make himself capable of doing the comedy? Now, what, <laughs> now, were your parents here? What did they go? I mean, my oh, my father's a great story. My father, um, uh, not long after they were here, he did a couple of things. He fucked all of my what, my mother's friends and all of his friends' wives, and I don't mean some. I mean pretty much all. And uh, he, here, yeah, in Australia, yeah, he and he'd done this in the states as well. He's, he, if there's any addiction in my family, um, it's it's him. He had a sexual addiction, for uh -huh. sure. He was mad about it. So screwed everybody. And then he got into, he went into business for himself. That went south. And rather than facing it, he split. But what he did was he, he faked his own death. So he set up this thing where everyone thought he was dead. How did he do that? I mean, he where... left his car on a pier and left, sent a note to his Oh, like solicitor. he killed himself? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, basically that just gave him a head start. And uh, he, you know, a couple of years later, my mother, he, he made the mistake. He went all around the world doing weird things. He used to be in the Green Beret, so he had this weird background. Yeah. And he went around, as far as I can tell, although he wanted people to think this because he's melodramatic, he went around the world, you know, being a mercenary and stuff. But he met a woman. He was a mercenary or he really did that? Yeah, he, well, you know, he wanted us to think that. I mean, he may have done a little was he, bit. He was a Green Beret in Vietnam or no, Korea? No, he didn't go to Vietnam. Oh. He pretended uh, to go insane. And got an honorary discharge. From the Green Berets. Yeah, because they were going to Vietnam. And he kind of went, oh, this is really fun until it gets real. Right. Know? But um, he he ended up meeting another woman. He changed his name from William Fleet to William Lee. Okay, so he, he he's dead to you. Yeah, he's dead. No but one knows it. I think people kind of suspected that he wasn't. You know, I was young, so I don't remember this really clearly. But, yeah, after a while, I think people thought, okay, he's probably not dead. But right. He changed his name to Lee from Fleet, mm -hmm. married another woman, had a family. Uh, and then her her father owned a business in Melbourne, a um, real estate company. The wife. Yeah. Yeah. So stupidly, he moved from remote Queensland back to Melbourne. Yeah. And one day, someone saw him walking down the street and told my mother, and she just walked into his office. So you know, four years later, he's just do 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 do, -do in his office, and this woman no walks in. Yeah, and um, you know, she was there money at stake? Did you, she take? Oh, did yeah. he take all your mom's money and that kind yeah, of yeah. shit? Yeah, oh. yeah. She was from a really wealthy family. He wasn't. Uh huh. And uh, yeah, she ended up working like dead end jobs to get us through school, and you know, he wrecked he wrecked her life. But look, they're both crazy, and they both drove each other insane. You know. So when she goes back to see him now, do they have a relationship now? 
No, not at all. I mean, no, not at all. Um, he lives in the States. She oh, lives he's back? Here. Yeah. With he the, married another wealthy woman. A third woman. family? Now? Fourth. The fourth. fourth. Fourth wealthy woman. Yeah, and wealthy woman. And um, like the first person he married, he decided that wasn't working. So what he did was he, he'd ignore her for a long time. Then he introduced her to one of his army buddies, who was kind of a handsome guy. Yeah. And so he'd go out and visit her and, you know, console her and stuff like that. And then, of course, one day they kissed on the doorstep or something. And my father was in the bushes, you know, jumps out. How could you? And punches his friend and divorces oh, the woman. Oh, you know, so now he's got an excuse. Yeah, exactly. So now, uh, so do you talk to your dad? Um, he actually sent me an email. And this is how lazy I am. I saw it the other day on my email thing. And I haven't read it. But uh, so occasionally we do. Yeah, but I... I um, if I had a computer here now, I'd open it up and we could read it together for the first time. It could be, you know. The weird thing about him is he's never apologized or anything like that. But he did say some great things. He told me once, you know how there's all these meaningful things like if is the middle word in life? Yeah. He took me aside when I was 12 and he went, hey, Greg, you know why I changed my name to, to Lee that time? And I said, no. And he said, because cause Lee is the middle word in fleet. <laughs> and it, 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 it had the rhythm of something that made sense. But so that was his real name. And he just, yeah. no. <laughs> you know, he just, uh, yeah. So your dad's nuts. Yeah, quite nuts. They're all nuts. Yeah, I, I, I understand that. But it's too bad you didn't get the gift of, uh, you know, seducing wealthy women. Oh, I know. I know that. You just, uh, you decided to, to do comedy instead. Yeah, it was, um, it's frustrating. But he, did, he was, um, he was like the camel man, like the Marlboro man. He was like on the back of, you know, magazines because he's quite handsome. He, he took up acting and stuff like that later. Your father on. did. Yeah. And there's like pictures of him lying on the back of a tugboat, throwing ropes overboard and smoking a camel. And really? Stuff. Yeah. So you yeah. got into that? Yeah, he got into that. And, uh, you know, small parts in movies. He had uh, like two lines in a James Garner film called Tank. Mm. But, uh, yeah. You talked to your mom? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we, uh, we get on. I mean, we uh, drive each other crazy. We went for about five years where we didn't speak at all. But more recently, we're starting to again. Well, you seem pretty healthy. You don't seem all sweaty and No, up. I am healthy. Um, How many times have you been, like, like when I saw you in 92, when did you first end up getting sober? Oh. Or off the dope, anyways. Not, I mean, yeah, I'd stop and start, you know, but I'd, I'd stop then and just do other things, as you know. You know, you'd give up your drug of choice and then do all the other ones. Sure. And go, I'm so healthy, it's great. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's a tough one to kick, you know. And yeah. and, and, and I want to thank you for uh, helping me out uh in this trip to Melbourne, by uh, you know, I, you asked me for twenty five dollars, and I gave it to you, <laughs> and I've been able to use it on stage because apparently there isn't one person in Melbourne that you haven't borrowed money from. There's actually two comics I haven't borrowed money from, <laughs> and we were talking about this before. One of them said to me the other day that both of them feel somehow that they're being shut out of right. this really exclusive club that you know, that they're somehow not good enough comics for me to borrow money from. So, they, you know, they feel really bad. So I better go borrow some money well, from Well, wait them. till you really need it and yeah. make it big. <laughs> yeah. Make them feel really special. Yeah. You guys are so special, I need $500. <laughs> yeah. Everyone else, it was just 25 Now, Now, knowing that you have all these debts everywhere. Mm. Do you... I don't really. I mean, I've actually paid. Someone when said I that. Someone stopped... said eventually you pay it back. Yeah. Kinda. And when I first stopped using yeah like for, you know what when i said first up when i stopped the most recent time which seems like you know the final time i um actually went around paying people and everyone was really shocked and it was actually a good way though to let people know that you're sober is you, you know you're actually paying them back sure. they go wow this is actually happening yeah. but uh there was this great time where people could come up to me and go Hey man, look, I really need that eighty bucks, and I'd give it to them. Yeah, and then they go, "You don't really owe me eighty bucks," you know, because like, I just assumed anyone who said that I, it was true. You know, <laughs> so if somebody catches you on the right day, you just they look, can just I'm, ask you for the money that, that I'm you sure owe them. That, yeah, I'm sure there are people out there I've paid money to that I never owed it to. Well, know? good for them. Yeah. They've got you, your own game. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're sitting back and having an exotic lunch, and I'm I'm sitting somewhere going, "Oh man, I really needed that money, but I guess at least I'm paying my debts." <laughs> So now this uh, the show you did a few years back uh, about the addiction. What was uh, what was the angle on that? Um, I did a show called Ten Years in a Long Sleeve Shirt." Yeah, and um, it was basically I was drawing parallels between love and um, and addiction, and how for me most of the times when I got into taking a new drug or whatever, it was through a romantic situation. Really? So yeah. How do you mean? Well, like I'd meet a girl, yeah. and she'd be into something. Okay. And so she'd go, oh, do you want to try this? And I'd do it. And so I always equated, uh, and still do, 
romantic love with addiction, you know, and, um, you know, so to me... Well, there's something uh, very nurturing about heroin. Well, there is. There is in a way. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that, that on some level that's what we're all looking for is that, uh, that warm feeling of, uh, mm -hmm. of comfort and being okay. Yeah, and having, having a couple of Asian guys looking for you to break your legs to get food. No, that's yeah. probably not part of it. But, yeah, <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah I, I, like, always equated, I always equated taking a new drug with, um, with, you know, for the first time, usually it would be the same day that I'd end up sleeping with somebody for the first time. Like what new drugs? I mean, you, the first time you did dope was with who, a woman? Yep. Yeah, first time I did, uh, did heroin was with a woman, and um, we... You wow, know, you must up... be really grateful for that. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was a great <laughs> she relationship. <laughs> she, really, she really got you started on a lifelong journey that yeah. you, you've got to just wake up every day and, uh, and thank, thank her, her for. Yeah. And she's, of course, been clean for 15 years and has a really good life, and I'm still out there scrambling around. But, um, so they still talk? Yeah, yeah, we do. We, oh, see, really? we do see each other occasionally. She's great. But it wasn't like she got me into it. I mean, it, she did give me the first time I did it, but, I mean, I would have found it somewhere else. Sure. So, That's a nice way to put it. But, yeah. But so I've always equated, you know, new drug experiences with romance and therefore all the insecurity that goes with that and the, the um, obsession and the addiction and, you know, needing, you know, like everyone says that giving up cigarettes or giving up a certain drug is like ending a relationship. Yeah. And for me, heroin ended up being by far the longest relationship I'd had with anyone or anything. So yeah. it really was. And, you know, if when you end something like that, I actually in rehab once had to write a letter to heroin breaking off the relationship. Uh -huh. And it seemed like a dicky thing to do, but it was right. actually great. Because right. you're saying all these things like, the whole time we were together, I was dedicated to you. I spent all my money trying to you know, keep you around. And, and you know, I didn't realize this, but all, the, all that time you were seeing other people. You know? I was dedicated to you, but you were seeing anyone who had the money. And, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, but, um, yeah. And, uh, it's, but, but after that, you and heroin got back together a few times. And oh, yeah, we'd party. <laughs> But, you know, or heroin would come around and be all depressed because she'd split up with her recent boyfriend and I'd just <laughs> console her. <laughs> but, um, yeah, look, it went on and off and on and off for ages. But well, around the it? time I met you, yeah. or re-met you in Edinburgh, so right. five years ago, yeah. um, was around the time that I, I, I seriously started to end it. You know, before that, it was just I'd give up because I ran out of money or I'd give up because... I ran out of money. No, yeah, yeah. I, it was, <laughs> yeah, it was never serious, and yeah. it was never, it was never long term. It was always like, I'll stop this for a few months. Yeah, you know. But then around the time of meeting you, you know, I'd been to a rehab before that, and then, you know, you and I spent that month together. And well, that was that was insane because I met you and I recognized you. I sat down, I ordered a club soda. You mm -hmm. said you ordered a beer. You said, "Why are you drinking club soda?" I said, "I don't drink," and you said, "I shouldn't be either." Mm -hmm. And somehow I talked some shit to you, and then yeah. we ended up going to meetings for a month. Yeah, and it was great. For it was me. good. It was good. Yeah, and and uh, I mean the show I did about addiction, I actually did in Edinburgh, and um, it was uh, it was great because I, I sort of got into this thing, and I, I don't know if you ever do this, but I, I was doing these thematic shows over a couple of years. I, I did the one about addiction. I did one about this horrendous uh, holiday I had in Thailand, but. They were shows that had, you know, they were mostly funny. So they'd yeah. be, you know, look at this idiot, you know, it was always about me being an idiot, you know, and, you know, you know, hock shops or, you know, what do you call them? Um, pawn shops. Pawn shops, you know, resembling my living room, you know, because all my stuff would be in there and I'd go in and, you know, change the positioning of some of the things and say, it looks better like this. And <laughs> this is but, how I had it at home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, there was all the funny things of, of drug addiction and stuff and, and, you know, like funny stories about taking LSD and the funny things that can happen or, you know, all that kind of stuff. But then also in there would be like... Um, my girlfriend overdosing and dying or something so it'd be like 95 percent hilarious and five percent quite tragic did that know? happen yeah yeah so there'd be when did that happen oh 80 89 or something but were you in the, the room? audience yeah, yeah yeah but for the audience it would be this great journey of of like hilarious 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 and then deeply tragic and suddenly and like i remember every night there was this moment in the show where he would just there'd just be silence and one night I heard this woman in this you know sort of laugh 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 oh my god silence and I just heard this one voice in the crowd go oh no and it was an incredible feeling because then you go back to comedy straight away you would have to have a really good joke to break that that tragic vibe but people would leave 
having been on this incredible journey, and they actually liked it better than when I just did shows that were just funny, 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 funny. Well, yeah, well, theater, and if there's an arc, and there's a, you know, there's something happens, and then there's a, you know, some sort of transformation. I mean, I, I assume that after that show, you got clean in the narrative, right? Yeah, well, I mean, the trouble with that show was, and there's, a, it's on YouTube. It's called Ten Years in a Long Sleeve Show. There's a half hour version of it on YouTube that I did as a TV special. Yeah. But if you look at it, you can see I'm stoned. Oh. So I'm actually doing this show about how I used to be a heroin addict on heroin. You know? mm. So that was problematic because I did that for a couple of years. That was problematic? Yeah. Because <laughs> you're like, saying you're yeah. not on heroin anymore? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, borrowing money off people. So that's where I think I said that to you the other day. Hey, man, can I borrow 80 bucks to fix my fridge? Yeah. I actually had a guy say that to me once. I just looked at this guy and I'm just like, you don't have a fridge. So in that moment, though, because, I mean, that's about, you know, when it comes to uh, to heroin stories, that's, that's really the worst that can happen. I mean, you know, there's plenty yeah. of people that almost die, but mm -hmm. when you have somebody that you're with mm -hmm. die, I mean, what, what, was the, this, what was the story there? Well, that wasn't really my – that was someone I'd seen a little bit but um, the, the the really tragic or the, the upsetting story in that when I would do that show was my actual girlfriend who I first started doing it with, she OD'd. Uh, she didn't actually die, but what happened was she OD'd. I turned around and she's out. She's like, I'd never seen anyone do this, but she's like not breathing. Her skin's going black. She's, uh, she's you know, no pulse. I'm trying to reviver and doing all this stuff and there was another guy there who was her really good friend this gay guy who was like the three of us were really close yeah. so I just said keep her breathing keep her breathing and I went running out in the street to try and f get an ambulance or something I went out and all these surreal things happened I went out in the street and I said is, is anyone here a doctor and this guy came running, running up to me and went I'm an accountant <laughs> that's not going to help <laughs> no. but I went back inside the house and my friend had fallen asleep on top of my girlfriend instead of keeping her breathing had just nodded off on top of her so they're Ugh. both out it's like fucking train spot. Oh, man, it was, yeah, very much so. So, you know, eventually ambulance guys come. And I'm, the other thing, I kept picking her up and slapping her, trying to wake her up. And yeah. I found out later that what I was doing was actually knocking her out. I was so panicking. I was hitting her so hard that she probably would have come too. Except right. every time she started to, I'd slap her and probably knock her out again. But these guys came, the ambulance came, they gave her a shot of this stuff, Narcane, which yeah. is, you know, reverses the effects of heroin. And nothing, nothing happened, nothing happened. And I, the, the feeling, it's so hard to describe this feeling that goes through you when you go, you know, your whole world's caved in, she's dead, you know, like, yeah. you, you haven't thought about, you know, her family telling her mother and father, your family, like, just the fact that she's gone, all this stuff starts descending on you. And they gave her another shot of Narcan and suddenly she, she just went, <gasps> and sat up. Yeah. And, you know, they sort of brought her around. And the first thing she said to me, she went... Have you had yours? And I said, no. And she went, give me half. Oh, no, <laughs> Just come on. unbelievable. Yeah, oh, absolutely so, true. So strung out. Yeah. And yeah. then, but that was the one that got sober, huh? Yep. Yeah, oh, she's fuck. remarkably. But, um, so none of these incidents, like what, have you, did you ever die? No, oh, uh, well, um, the last, uh, one of the la very last times I used heroin was in Ireland. And I um, hadn't done it for a long time, the classic story. I'd been clean, going to meetings and stuff like that. Hadn't done it for a long time. And I just was in that mood. I found myself going for a walk in Ireland, which is, I don't often go for walks. Or in Kilkenny? No, in Dublin. Uh -huh. And then I found myself just happened to be walking around the dodgy part of town. Like, sure. wow, I just ended up in this yeah, part of town. I understand this. Yeah, and yeah. look at those guys over there. They seem to be on some kind of, they're very tired. <laughs> and um, so I ended up scoring from this guy, took him back to my hotel. Yeah. He, I bought him some. And he told me, too. He said, look, one thing about this stuff, it's crap. You know, unfortunately, it's not very good. Yeah. So he had his and left, and I had mine, and I woke up in hospital. And there was all this embarrassment and shame. Basically, I'd OD'd in the hotel room, hadn't turned up to my gig. They had sent someone back to the hotel. The owner of the gig had come back to my hotel, got the manager of the hotel to come up and open my room. Right. And I'm in there. There's syringes all over the place. I'm unconscious on the floor. They put me in a in a wheelchair and get me to hospital, and I finally come to in hospital and go, "What am I? Why am I in hospital?" And I didn't realise I was in Ireland, and I'm going, "Why has everyone got an Irish accent?" <laughs> and I leave this hospital. They're telling me to stay. I said, "No, I've got to get to work." I bolt to this gig, and it's all it's over. It's all finished. And I go up to the owner of the venue and I say, "Oh, sorry, man, 
I was on my way here and I got rolled by these two guys and they took my wallet and then da da da. And he's just looking at me. He's, he's the guy that's just come around and got me off the floor and taken me to hospital. So I'm telling this elaborate lie. And as I'm telling it, I'm going, oh, this isn't working. And so that was, that was, that was the only time I'd ever OD'd though. And that was one of the very last times I used. How, how the hell did you manage? I mean, how old are you? 47? 48, yeah. So you're my age mm. and you, and you didn't, you didn't get hep C. You didn't get AIDS. I know. That's remarkable. And you're stuff. still, you seem to be pretty, uh, you know, Pretty fat? Are you saying I'm fat? You're fat. Yeah. You're I didn't definitely. used to be. I actually do this thing now where I stand on stage side on because I, I always used to be quite skinny and the audience sees that I've actually developed this kind of fat stomach and I just and they they think you're doing well. They think they like, do. Oh, please, it's good. They do. But yeah. I, I point at my stomach and I say, ladies and gentlemen, one thing I just want to say to the young people is, never give up heroin. Yeah. <laughs> You'll just be a fat old man. Like but me. but over the process of what's got to be 20 years of this shit mm -hmm. or 15 years. 25. Of this, Right, since you've been a professional comic, I mean, you know, the infamy of it has probably how's it affected your career? Well, I mean, I, you've done what TV? You've been on? Yeah. I mean, you've done acting, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, TV, I've just written a, I've just written a series, a TV series about comics. So it's about five comics who are friends and just what comics do when they're not on. But stage. do people trust you? Or are you ever going to regain? Well. Not really, I don't think. And um, but this TV show hopefully will be. Uh, there's a lot riding on it for me, but it, it's kind of like my reintroduction to that world. And if it goes as well as I think it will, and it, it does look incredible, it's, I'll, I'll send you a copy of it. You can okay. tell me what you think. But it, it's um, it's got good people in it. Uh, a lot of well-respected people here and in the UK are in it. But um, if that works, I think I'll get a lot more trust and a lot more. You know, like. Though uh, there's some talk of doing a second season of it and stuff, so there's a lot. You know, I've kind of got all my eggs in one basket on well, that level. Well, everybody knows you on this side of the world and in, in England. I mean, mm. Stuart Lee speaks highly of you, and and everybody mm. seems to know you, a Fleet, your your infamous character, mm. and they respect your comedy. Yeah, but that's about it. That's where the respect ends. Because <laughs> they do, they do respect comedy. But I mean, to a lot of people, uh, like Stuart is incredibly frustrated by me and I, it makes me feel bad because Stuart Lee works incredibly hard um, you know he's, he's incredibly creative and talented he has a lot of time for my work and has helped me a lot but I also upset him you know he, it, it's upsetting for him to see someone wasting ability or you know not achieving what they could achieve so it's um well you say that with a certain detachment I mean does it uh, upset just, you just, oh, enormously so it, what do you do with that well what you should do with it is is um Stop behaving like a fucking idiot and work hard and you know. And, and what do you do? Just game. beat the shit out of yourself until you. Yeah, I'll just I'll just keep you know rolling those dice. Going, I don't have to do the work. I'm lucky, <laughs> lucky old fleet. Hey, seven. See, <laughs> you know. So, uh -huh. but more recently, I've actually been doing it, and that's why writing the TV show was a great thing because I think a lot of people didn't think I'd get it done. Um, I wrote it as a play, and we did it in the comedy festival about six years ago. But turning it into a TV show was great, and. Um, I think it'll. I think it will work, and it will be a way into that world of responsibility. And then I, I assume I will pick up the ball and run with it, and actually do more and more and more. Or I'll do what I used to do, which is get really cocky and go, "Wow, see, I've done a great thing. I could probably do this and use heroin at the same time, and everything would work out great." So, yeah. uh, so we don't know what's going to happen. Well, I can't imagine I would do that. If I did that again, I'd, I would be seriously, it would be like committing suicide, you know, career-wise. And, you know, I've got a kid now and all that sort of stuff. It's You've not, had a kid for nine years. Yeah, I know, but I only just realized. <laughs> 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 but, uh, but, you know, yeah, you just, you can't, you know, I need to earn money. I need to, you know, get school fees for her and give her a decent life and, uh, you know, and also I'm egotistical, like anybody. You know, I, anyone in comedy, I want to do things that are that are admired. So, you know, I'm running out of time. So this is, you know, this is time to, you know, I've had a great life. I've done what I wanted to do. I've been really self-indulgent, and now is kind of. I mean, and the other thing is, giving up heroin is is you're actually gaining. You know, it's like as you'd know, it's you're not really giving anything up. You're, you're getting a whole lot of other stuff. You know, yeah. you're getting opportunities and work and right. trust, and so. What is it about the dope? Mm. I, mean, it, I think it's what you said before about sec, you know, like security warm, or what, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is bizarre because you think 
it makes you the most insecure person, you know, because you don't know where your next taste is coming you from. You got to rely on it. You got to go into shitty buildings. Oh yeah, and get shitty people. Yeah, yeah. You know, you get threatened with getting stabbed and stolen from. And have you gotten to the point where you had to steal shit? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, not really had to, but I did, you know, and only from people around me, which is so just really people bad. you know. Yeah, people yeah. I love, you yeah. know, people who loved me and yeah. trusted me. Yeah. So never from strangers or you know. Are there houses you can't go to? No, not really. But not I, anymore. I, I imagine. Like, was it ever to the point where your mom was like, "Nope, can't come over"? No, I never got that. I never got that. But uh, I'm sure there were, you know, there'd be people who, if I saw them or went around to their house, would, you know, they wouldn't just leave their wallet on the middle of the table. You know, yeah, I, I kind of kinda thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> but your wallet never has any money, and I check it all the time. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you're all right, man. You know, it all works with comedy and stuff because, you know, you can do... I find the more tragic and shit a thing that happens to you, the better it is for comedy. I, well, yeah, I agree, whether it hap happens in your mind or in real life. Well, yeah, but I mean, you know, relationships ending, anything like that. I, I, there's always part of me now, while something bad's happening to me, part of me in the back of my brain, the bit. while it's happening, is going, one day I'll make money out of this. You know, one day I, this will be a routine. Really? Even if I'm crying. I was crying once. And yeah. I was going, oh, 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 this, this is actually could be quite good soon. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, what is it? well, I, I, uh, I definitely appreciate you talking. Oh, man, I love it. And I, I, um, I really like the show. And it's, it's, a, it's a thrill to be on it. So, and we're going to do some live one or something. Apparently. Yeah, we are. On Saturday. Cool. Talk to you later. See ya. <laughs> My guest here is Simon Munnery. The Now, you get some of the similar things that I get, which is a legend, a cult figure. Yeah. And I find that those genius. things... Genius? You have that one? Uh, rarely. You get well, genius. That's good. Well, you, well uh, it's not, I don't think it's good. It's a, a, what, what does the word genius mean? It's uh, Solon Kierkegaard's got quite a nice bit about it, how, how you people use the word genius to distance themselves. Like, that's other. Yeah. I mean, what, what, what does it mean? There's a lot of geniuses in town. Sure. Yeah. Usually time, yeah. genius means that uh, you know not everyone understands them, uh, but they've been around a long time and, and they should be understood, but it's not on me to do it. But a comic genius is sort of a contradiction in terms. You'd think a comic genius would be someone that no one found funny, but possibly the future would. That's right. right. <laughs> That's but, exactly what but, it is. But they don't mean that. A comic genius is very, very funny right now, right. but somehow... Uh, it's different. a way of saying he's different. Different, yes. <laughs> different. Than, than the rest of them. <laughs> they, they, he stands out from the pack. Right. Yeah. Now, in, in, in terms of, like, I don't want to uh, seem stupid or ignorant, but I, I do not... Uh, my pulse is... My, my, hand, my fingers are not on the pulse... Of, of British comedy or international comedy as much as it should. You know, I talked to, uh, when I was in London, I talked to Stuart Lee, mm. who, uh, you know, has nothing but uh, lovely things to say about you. Yeah, but uh, in his book, in my fi f favorite piece he does in his book, I'm mean, appearing in a lot of his notes yeah. in his, uh, his book, which is uh, Simon Munnery, who is by no means a household name, even in his own house, where his uh, <laughs> wife and three lovely daughters habitually refer to him as Mr. Poo Poo Head. <laughs> Which is too near the truth to be did funny. You, did you start with him though? Like, what, where where do you put your beginnings in comedy? I mean, what what years? Like, what, I've been doing it twenty five years. So I started when I was nineteen at college. Yeah. yeah. When what did you study when you went to school? Because you seem sort of high minded. Science. A little bit of science. But a little bit of science. A very little. Once, as soon as I got to university, I, I kind of hated it. I went went off it very within about a week. I was really looking forward to it all through school. They said, "Wait till you're in the sixth form." All through the sixth form, wait till you're in the uh, university. And I got there and I went. Oh, it's the same. It's le learn this, learn that. There's an exam coming. <laughs> learn it. I remember sitting in this lecture hall where there's 2,000 students and a man at the front with an overhead projector reading out notes from his book and writing them down on the overhead projector and we were all copying them out and it seemed, you know, uh, that could be done with a photocopier, couldn't it, really? There's no, what is this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I just <laughs> went off it. it. That was it? Really? You quit? It. Well, you know, I stayed. I, didn't, I should have changed subject, but I just didn't go to any more lectures or... To, or paid no attention to it uh -huh. anyway. In fact, I met my uh, supervisor on the last uh, the last week of uh, of the last year. I met him and I said, um, he's meant to be supervising me every week and I've never been. Yeah. So he never met me. Oh, the whole so time. Said, oh, yeah. look, the exam's coming up. Could you recommend one book I could read? <laughs> you know, come on, there's been a week. So <laughs> Oh, uh, okay. But I'd just slip through the net. Because I'd never been, yeah. he'd never sent reports. So people who are higher up in charge of looking after my academic welfare never got a bad report. There was no positive. It was just, so I just fell through the net and they didn't, they didn't notice. <laughs> I, I just there. got some weird kind of panic. 
of that that thought of like not going to class and then having to do the exam. Yeah, I I I, I still have dreams about that. It's, it's, it's amazing what school does. How it's imprinted on you that, that oh, jumping the, over hurdles. Horrendous, horrendous. Yeah. So when you deal with like, because I, I watched your show the other night, and like I said, I, I didn't grow up with you uh, in, in the same scene. It, when you do something that, you, you, like, even when you talk about the Nietzschean character, that you know that the audience is going to be baffled yeah. a bit for a yeah. long time, uh, if it, it, maybe even the entire time. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> d- is, is, is that something that you get a, a thrill out of, or do you really think in your mind that they are going to get it eventually? Uh, well, I, 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 if I think of how I work, is if something makes me laugh, right. I want to know if it makes other people laugh. Right. So it's kind of a sharing thing. And, uh, and sometimes you have to abandon something after enough tries. No, that's not going to work. But there's often little bits. You know, most things I think of, most people find funny. Yeah. I think in an yeah. audience. Um, people who come to see me specifically, there's even more chance. Yeah. But still, there'll be some things that just don't work. And, but then, you know, you hone it, I think, that you do it lots of times. I don't, I don't, I'm very slow to give up with something completely. If it made me laugh once and I've still got the gl- gist of why I found that funny, I wouldn't be able to put it into words. But something about that made me funny. Some, anyway, like, I'll, I'll, I'll keep on with it until I'm absolutely convinced there's no hope for it. What, what's, an example, what's an example of something that you've just locked onto and refused to let go of, despite the fact? <laughs> despite the, okay. What I used to do, is, uh, some, I like a joke where you just have to play for luck as well sometimes. Like, know, what does that mean? Um, well, you know, it's, there's no def- it's not definitely going to work. Right. But you yeah. might as well try it. Yeah. Which is, uh, as Alan Parker, this character, you see. The punk guy. Yeah. I used to go, Has anyone here, to the audience, has anyone here ever felt totally alone? And what I'm praying for is uh, one person goes, Yeah. Yeah. And I go, Oh, it's just you then. It's one of those just, we, it's a sort of just you yeah, then, yeah. or just me then format. Right. Uh, anyone, you know, anyone here, you know, right. know what it's like when Did you. Did it happen sometimes? Yes, oh, per- perfectly. Oh, good. Uh, and, and other times not. But I'd, yeah. I'd leave the gap and I'd wait. And yeah. Have, you know, that's... Like, w- like I watched a show the other night and it's called, what is it called, Self-Employed? It is. And that, is that more of a, do you generate a new hour every year? Oh, you got me. Go and put the cuffs on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. No, I mean, uh, I, it's, a tough, it's a tall order. That is, that is it's basically the show I did last year uh, honed more. Uh-huh. Uh, with a new front end, well, with a back end now. I stick the, the conceptual restaurant sketch was new last August. But if you could explain it to me, the, the restaurant sketch in your mind, I'm just, I'm fascinated. I, I wanted to do it outside, yeah. uh, ha- create my own venue, sort of tie, you know, cardboard and uh, canvas and a lightweight stuff. Yeah, uh-huh. a, a conceptual restaurant that I could put anywhere. Right. And I built a trolley for it. That was the first thing I did, so I could store all the dishes without them getting broken. Yeah. And uh, I performed it once. I just set it up in my garden. I, uh, it's quite a big garden. And next door neighbor's mother-in-law saw me doing it and was attracted over by the very sight of me. And uh, she was my first customer. She came in, she laughed her head off. So I thought, this works. Now, okay, so I built this trolley. I tried to attach it to a bike. It broke the thing that connected it because it was completely unstable. I never built a trolley before. Um, I've learned a lot about it. Don't make it um, top heavy and uh, unstable. So then I was going to Edinburgh, planning to just do a straightforward set. And I thought, I've got that. Really, I don't need the trolley. I don't need all I need is the dishes. Actually, I can do it. I'll do it as a sketch. So I did it as a sketch with a, a chair and table on the stage. And I used to get get people up to go in the restaurant. And I realised, no, they're, they're sitting in chairs anyway. Why bother? <laughs> it took two days to work that out. Yeah, like, yeah. Of course. It's awkward. They don't want to. It's, what, what happened was two people didn't want to get up. They yeah. wouldn't, and, uh, you know, the thing, if, if they don't want to, you've either got to, you've just got to make them. You can't, you can't not. I, I tried to ridiculous, you know, should have learned this years ago, but you know, would you like to come up and say, no. Okay, then you try someone else. Of course, they don't want to either. No, yeah, yeah. If, if, no one wants if, to volunteer. No. So, then what? You're stuck. And I realised, well, there's no need for them to come up. I can just move the table towards them. They're in yeah. it. Don't yeah. give them a choice. You're yeah, in it. they're at the restaurant. Oh, things are so the restaurant is basically uh, it's different countries, right? Different when, countries. Well, I mean, there, there's one uh, restaurant where you have Belgium on the oh, no, plate. It's a, it's a, basically, the, the restaurant is con- it's a conceptual restaurant. There's no food. It's, right. it's art. Right. So broad canvas. What it is is each each dish, and it's a it's a coal scene. There's, there's masses more in there that can be done. That's, sure. that's just as far as I've got with it. Uh, like a dish, and what it is a description in the menu. 
followed by a surprise of some sort, preferably there's some sort of activity involved, like a, you could have a murder mystery on a plate and right. you have to work out something. <laughs> right. And a, a, you can have a performance element as well by the waiter. Yeah. He can sing, right. uh, yeah. dance it to you, something, right. offer you things to go with it. You can have little... So basically that sort of format of a restaurant, which is theatre anyway, yeah. apart from the food element. You know, the, so the inspiration was that, the, that there's a presentation by a waiter in a real restaurant. And, um, and on some level you thought that you could extend that or, or, or break it open. Yeah, to, take, to make a, a restaurant without food. So it's just all, as I say, all the rigmarole of haute cuisine without the shame of eating. <laughs> uh, what I love about that phrase is you probably hadn't thought there was a shame in eating. <laughs> there is sort of a shame in well, eating. Well, there is now. <laughs> the, 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 yeah. the, the, but I don't think it's, it's in the public consciousness that much. Yes, perhaps it is. There is, I know, getting too fat. There's that. There's that well, there's an awkwardness to it. I went to a fancy restaurant last night where I had that moment where there was such a... There, there was a labor to the, the, the waiter, the waitress, you know, telling me, explaining dishes as, as being, you know, having bouquets and there's a, she was a refreshing. Yeah, but it's this, it's weird poetics that it's, it's yeah. fairly recent. And it, oh, it's hard for it not to be ridiculous because not only is it ridiculous when you're hearing it, yeah. in a way you're like, come on, it's just yeah. fucking ice cream. And, and, but then when you're eating it, there, the shame is like, I'm not getting the bouquet. I'm not. I'm yeah. not, maybe I'm not Emphasis appreciating clothes, sort of yeah, thing. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's awfully good, but yeah. it's a bit much. It's not, the whole the it's ad not overhyped. You can't. Well, it's beautiful, but it's it's still just food. You know. <laughs> yeah. So the the, the sort of uh, the mechanism is that the, you get a description in the me in the menu, which I yeah. find ridiculous. Like yeah. It's a description of something that doesn't exist yet, as mm -hmm. well. So, uh, oh, well, I've, and the time people spend poring over the the menu, going, oh, all oh, that, you, oh, so much to read, so many decisions to make. Yeah, yeah. It's all. Uh, but I thought there's a, there's a lot can be played with that. You know, you could have the waiter could actually to look at you and decide what you want. He could know what you want, so, yeah. and then not give uh, you the choice. No, yeah, no. the illusion of choice. But yeah. in fact, it's a very obvious what yeah. you're going to have. So that, that's way. actually the seeds to a whole show. Uh, it's a, a thing, a whole outdoor thing, uh, a franchise, eventually. Uh -huh. but, so uh, you'll have a chain of these restaurants. I'd, l I'd like to see a field with lots of different ones, yeah. <laughs> Imagine that, so, uh, and other things. So. Well, I think that the thing I like about this, Simon, is that uh, it, it has nothing to do with show business. Right, thank you. <laughs> I, I claim I'm still in it. <laughs> you know that, that joke which ends what? And leave showbiz? Yeah. yeah. That, uh. do, do you ever find that that, that, that is a, an issue in, in terms of how you think about it? Like, how am I going to uh, continue making money if I'm going to be setting up outdoor art restaurants? Not that that's important. I think well, art is good. I reckon, uh, well, you know, I'll charge people. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, you you might come in. We're going to try it in Edinburgh this year. I'm going to do it on Portobello Beach, uh, top of Arthur's Seat. I'm going to, I've worked out how to do it now. We're going to pack it down to basically the size of two massive suitcases on wheels. So you can take it anywhere. Yeah. Poles, you've got chairs, tables, dishes packed neatly, you know, so they can be flipped out. Bang, set it up, do it, that you make an appointment via the internet, uh, you know, a reservation. Yeah. And uh, you do the whole thing. I hope, hope it works. It's, it's just, it's amazing to me that this, I, I don't, I can't quite explain why the history or why, you know, the, in Europe and, and in the UK and around that there, there's at least some appreciation of this, of the joke of art. I mean, I couldn't even consider doing anything like that in America because it would be such a small thing. You'd have to find a very sort of uh, specific audience that would even know the joke. I watched a bit of yours on YouTube about I explaining how your, uh, your comedy is almost modern art. The, oh, the ben, Venn ben diagram, diagram. Yeah. which is brilliant. Yeah. But, but that there's an audience for that is fascinating to me. Even the most alternative or hip audiences in America are not that sophisticated. And, and it's a, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a privilege you guys have in a way. Yeah. Oh, that, have you that's a good example. In America? Oh, I have, yeah. But uh, that, this, that's another example of something that you know didn't used to work. The Venn diagram. It didn't. Uh, well, it, it sort of. But, but again, when it doesn't work, that's you know, it's offensive in that you know you're rubbing people's ignorance in the face. I talk about a Venn diagram, but it's if you do it the right way, you can get away with it. It's fine. No one's going to be that. It's upset. very interesting to me that, that, that you actually see it as offensive. That it, well, it's it, a, in a sense offensive. No, like, I understand. Like an unexploded joke. Right. To so tell a joke. Yeah. That, uh, on a stage, people pay to laugh. You told a joke that they didn't get. Right. There, there's something. If I think there's an awkwardness out there. Uh, there's definitely an awkwardness. But right. is the onus on you for being offensive? That these. Well, people... it's somewhere between us. It's not. It's not certain who it is. I, they can blame me. I can blame them. They were a terrible audience. He was a terrible act. Right? Let's call it quits. But... but but have you ever gotten to the point where you're like, go home and Google this, 
or you know, or, or, or it's too late for that. What's the fuck? <laughs> but it's it's amazing you don't take. I, I mean, there's a certain humility in not taking the condescending route, and and saying like, if you're offended by this, it's because you're not smart enough to get it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I don't think there's any need to say that. <laughs> By the way, if you're not laughing, it's because you're thick. <laughs> All right, that's it. I've got ten minutes now. I'll get ten minutes out of that. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. If you don't laugh at my act, you're stupid. <laughs> we get that clear at the start. <laughs> Why don't you open it? Why don't you call the show that? That's some sort of IQ meter. Yeah. It's like all going down. You're not laughing. Oh, you're sick. Well, I think that's why uh, it's, lucky, it's lucky you don't do that. I, I don't know. It's, it's lucky. Not luck. I'm a survivor. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's not me. If I think of something, oh, that's impossible, you, you just want to try it, don't you? It's a bit like, right. right. Well, I'd, Lee against T. Jim became a oh, wow, what would that be like if someone came on instead of going, hello, nice to see you, or just came on going, you are scum, scum. <laughs> just right, abuse. Right, right. Yeah, so yeah, I did yeah. it, and it worked, and it was funny. But not everywhere. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And the reason I think it didn't work in Toronto or Melbourne is an English voice, particularly in America, you've got that culture, film culture anyway, mm -hmm. of, of uh, English being evil um, and slightly superior. Uh, attention scum, you are nothing, absolutely nothing, with an English voice saying it. Is, is very different from what I meant. Right? And in England, it's just like, oh, who, who's this bloke abusing us? But in the States, oh, it's an English... It's, it must be an evil. So, so yeah. I, the feeling I got in Toronto and in Melbourne when I did the league against Sydney was people going, what's he being rude? Well, it's definitely not saying, why is he being rude to us? Or, what's, <laughs> what's, what's, what have we done? You know, it's just, it's just rude. I don't, I don't, I don't <laughs> only get it. And Toronto as well. Like, why? Why just be rude to us? Because you're different. I'm, I'm not, it's, it was an English act for, to shout at English people by an English person, I think. And when I watch you now, when I want, and when I watch the recent show, having not known the history of you, it seems to me that you're, you have this life. Yeah. You know, you've got Thanks. your wife and your kids, yep. and you've got a house. Yeah. And and what I notice, and maybe it's it's not true, is that you know you have this, uh, you have a style that you've established, which is this this kind of, um, you know, pushing the envelope of funny and, and being absurd and using different elements. But there's also this part of you that just wants to talk about uh, your kids. Yeah. And, and and being in the country and stuff. Yeah. Uh, I. I but what that my act at the moment is formed like sedimentary rock over immense time and vast pressure. Um, so it's the bits I enjoy doing, it turns out most of it's true. So yeah, I do like talking about kids. And I know, as, as the reviewer kindly explained, it was uh, safe and predictable. Well, obviously, no joke is predictable if you laugh at it, otherwise you, you wouldn't have laughed. They said that about this show? Yeah. For parts of his material, they like the restaurant, they said that's brilliant, but safe and predictable. Talk about, I, I, everything I say, it's not... It has all happened, has occurred to me, and I, I find in, interesting, funny. It's not edgy in any way. It's just stuff about. Well, there's a bit. I don't. I don't even think about it. It's no. There's no point in thinking about it. This is what I do. I'm happy with it. Bits drop out. Bits come in. I, I got a good laugh out of the. Uh, you were. It felt like you were in a, a, a Swiss cuckoo clock with a moral theme. That's yeah. That line that's only occurred quite, quite late on. It just occurred quite, quite late and it never used to get a laugh. Really? As you say, and now and after a while, I realized, then it once it did, and I was no, no, that is funny. Just give it time. I just used to throw it away. I felt like a, you know, I was in a Swiss cuckoo clock with a moral theme, and uh, it gone. I thought, no, that's the punchline. I'll, I'll, right. I'll put, a, I'll put an underline under it. Well, people have to, they have to make that jump in their head. I, I have a hard time with audiences that aren't willing to do their side of it, where it's like, you, you, it's, not, it's not all going to be explained to you. you. You have to somehow reach into your memory and picture a Swiss cuckoo clock, or you're going to be in trouble. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're just going to sit there like And the, if they're not getting it, don't go faster. The, 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 old, the old counterintuitive law, don't, don't, they're not getting up, don't speed up. Uh, Basically, you've got, you just got to accept your fate. Yeah. Go down. It's also, a little psychological except, trick. I did that last you, night, though. God do, damn. Do you do that little trick? To, if ever you're, um, you ever think it's not, oh, that, that didn't work at all, that went for nothing. Yeah. Like, ding, 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 ding. Yeah. Dive, dive. No, don't do that. Just think they're saving up the laugh for later. Uh -huh. And often they are. And yeah. they will be. Yeah. Right? That's they a good pay thought. to laugh. They, like, basically, you're standing in the way of them laughing. Try and get out of the way, and the big wave of laughter will push through you. Yeah. Don't, don't no. let you be so important. Or, but, but then you have that moment where you're like, well, I guess that's the wave. It wasn't yeah. as big a wave as they thought. <laughs> ah, so, uh, <laughs> but it's <laughs> like to see. Another, then there'll be three big ones coming. They saved it up for later. 
laugh. They just couldn't laugh. And that's all right. So it's like a surfing. Oh, very, very I, I did that thing last night, though, where I sped up. And then, like, I started, uh, have you ever done that, where, where you, you do speed up and that's not working? And then you just, uh, you, you end bits in the middle on the yeah, first yeah, lap. Yeah, yeah. It's going to go on to the next or, one. Or the back foot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that, that, that back pocket is dwindling roughly off, but it's all just sand. <laughs> There's nothing. So when you, uh, what we call a bank, I don't know what you call it, you know, you're, you're absolute cast iron, so it's not going to fail. You slap that on the table. <laughs> and they go, ah, right, well, just the subtle stuff left then. Ooh. Oh. It was. It's a horrible feeling, isn't it? It is. It, is. it still is, right? Yeah, but so it's much better not to, uh, to decide from the beginning. I'm not. I'm not backing down. I'm going to do. I'm not going to try and. How do you I'm just going to do what I'm going to do. Yeah. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Uh, take my time. But if something happens, someone shouts out. That's different. You deal with yeah. it. But um, just do it as well as you can. Also, I've done gigs in uh, environments where you cannot hear yourself think, like at Glastonbury sometimes, or this, this festival I did in. Uh, hull where they had a <laughs> band started up in another venue. Like, I was trying to tune my guitar and it was just B everywhere. It was B. Yeah, you yeah. couldn't hear. You, I couldn't hear. You couldn't hear the audience. Anyway, oh, you just just got to do it as well as you can. Well, that was funny the other night. You know, when you were on stage at uh, in the room you're in, which is sort of a tent or a temporary theater of some yeah. kind, the Bosco Theater. And music started about halfway through, and it was irritating me because it was like a beatbox kind of music, and you're doing your thing, which is kind of uh, 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 nuanced and, 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 and absurd. And I'm like, what the fuck? I would hate to be performing in this venue. And then, like, and then you close with the restaurant piece, which is a completely, uh, you know, beautiful absurdity. And I walk out, and did you see what's making the music? The white rabbit. There's yeah, a the guy in a bunny white, suit playing yeah. bass. And Every I'm like, night he starts up. Just like, oh. it's like, and I'm thinking about. The show was doing better. I'd bribe him to stop. <laughs> I would, but uh, on this, on this level. I just couldn't figure out what was more absurd. <laughs> was your well-structured actor, me walking outside, and there's a guy in a man-sized bunny suit with a bass. I'm like, this is like a competition. I don't know if Simon realizes what he's up against. Yeah. yeah but... I like when people know their own limitations, because I think so many of us are, are kind of childish like that. We, we mm -hmm. just keep expecting the biggest. It must be interesting having children. Oh, yeah. It, it, is, it, uh, is it as enlightening as you thought it would be? It's, it's like joining the human race. Yeah. yeah, I imagine. I don't know if it's going <laughs> to happen for me. How old are your kids? Uh, seven, five, three. Oh, you've got time. Yeah. And that'll be... It, it really just, you just go, ah. And also, it just, it's continuous. It's like you're on the whole time, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but it must, it's sort of, uh, like, there's part of me that thinks, like, I can't really be a, uh, a well-rounded person if I don't have a child. That, where you, you're put in that you have, position. You've, you've never seen it from the other side. You know, it's, just, like, it's suddenly you, you see it from... Uh, you know, uh, you, any kind of resentment you had towards your parents, or uh, uh, suddenly you see it from the other side of what it was like to be. You know, when you find yourself saying the things that your father had said to you, yeah, you go, ah, yeah, okay, this, this is the way it has to go. Yeah. Because I say so. <laughs> you know, yes, yeah. no, we're crossing the road. Oh my hand. <laughs> yeah. Are we going? Yeah. And do you feel like it's it amazing. Did humanize you a bit somehow? Yeah, I'm really glad. Uh, and also love, absolutely love. Amazing how much you love these creatures. <laughs> yeah. Just uh, babies. I never used to have no interest in babies. Nothing. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. if someone's got a baby, oh, good. No, yeah. I don't want to hold yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I might go off. Good job. And, yeah. then, uh, and then suddenly, if I just see a baby now, my, my heart goes. Oh, fast. really? I go, oh, little ones. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, oh, just, they're, they're the most beautiful, funny. Yeah. They have to be cute. It's survival, yeah. not fittest, it's the cutest. Yeah. That's what, yeah, so they, they learn to do that, and they, they, they come at you running as well. Like, there's no better mirror than a child. They, they know you, they know you're every thought. Like, so, Eleanor, can you tidy your room? Well, yours isn't tidy. No, 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 no. Your <laughs> office is the what, least tidy room in this house. I go, oh, OK. Well, yeah, good point, good point. The, the other day, like, they're all asleep. Well, I mean, we've, we've got trouble getting over the jet lag, because I yeah. got over it, but they, then they jump. She's going, uh, it's 5 a.m. I said, look, if you could just... Maybe just try and sleep for another hour, right? And then that way, day by day, we'll, we'll get more on Australian time. Yeah. And she goes, you know, but people are sleeping still. She opens the curtain, looks out and goes, uh, well, there's cars and buses moving around. <laughs> I go, all right, you all right? Good point. Yep. <laughs> you win. You win. That's awesome. Well, hell, it was great talking to you. I knew. I think it's sort of sad. A reflection on my country that we don't know you guys and I don't know how yeah. that that's going to happen like Stuart Lee yeah. is, is another one where I did an hour with him and no one really knew who he was in my country except a few people yeah. and it's uh, it's it's just a, it's sort of a, a tragedy that doesn't go back and forth as much yeah how can we make that happen Simon I, I don't know you have to talk to your uh, it's, uh, it's, it's talk, my talk, side talk it's on my people. side yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, talk to your people I'll talk to my people <laughs>